Welcome to the Lexington Public Library's Tales from the Kentucky Room podcast, where we discuss everything Lexington and Fayette County history. I'm Miriam, and in each episode of this podcast, we will feature a guest that will share a piece of local history. So thank you for tuning in and enjoy. Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another episode. So recently, a personal finance blogging website named Wallet Hub ranked the city of Lexington as one of the five top best-run cities in America. U.S. News & World Report also ranked it as number 33 in the top 150 best places to live. Now, as a longtime resident of our beautiful city, I know this to be true. But as we are coming up on an important anniversary, the city-county merger, we wanted to bring your attention to one of Lexington's biggest milestones, which helped establish its standing as a great all-around city. On November 7, 1972, Lexington voters decided to overwhelmingly merge between the city of Lexington and Fayette County. This is what we know today as the Lexington Fayette Urban County Government. And of course, we have with us today our favorite guest, Wayne Johnson. He's going to give us a brief history on how the merger went down. Welcome, Wayne. Okay. Today, we're going to be talking about the Urban County Government merger. Yeah. Now, in 2025, Lexington will be celebrating its 250th anniversary of the founding and naming of Lexington. That's when the pioneers in June of 1775 gathered around a campfire at McConnell Springs and gave our city the name Lexington after the Battle of Lexington and the American Revolution. Now, during all these years since, the city has experienced many events of historical note, including political events. Now, Lexington was actually incorporated as a city in 1832, and since that time, we've had several different types of political systems in our city. Now, probably the biggest political event during our history and I think you can actually throw out the word probably it was the biggest political event in our history, occurred during the years 1970 through 1974. And we were in the midst of of the 50th anniversary of it. And that would be the merger movement, which began in 1970 and culminated in the official merger of the city and county governments on January 1st, 1974. Yeah, so when you say began, like, what was there, like, just one person that decided, hey, we need to merge our county and city, or? I'll talk about okay. that. Yeah, <laughs> that, right. that will be coming up. So, anyway, it culminated in the merger that took effect on January 1st, 1974, what is today known as our Lexington Fayette Urban County Government. Now, like I said, this era of merger formation during those years of 1970 to 1974 can be said to be the most important and most impactful in our history. And that's what we're going to be talking about in this podcast. Now, we have done many podcasts over the past few years since we started our Kentucky Room podcast program. If you can believe it. Yeah, yes. <laughs> and, and a lot of the topics may be seem to be a little more interesting and exciting than talk of a government merger. Oh, this is exciting. Okay. okay. (laughs) Uh, Baseball and Cassius Clay and those podcasts are pretty exciting. But anyway, it may seem like a dry subject, but it's, it's actually pretty interesting. But anyone that knows anything about our Lexington history knows the impact of this merger and how huge it was. It put our city on a path toward becoming uh, the progressive community that it is today. Lexington, as we know it today in 2021, and how things are run, can be said to be built on the back of the merger movement early 1970s. A lot of dedicated people put in a lot of hard work into the merger movement, and the city should uh, be thankful for that. Now, as a teenager Growing up in Lexington during the merger movement, uh, you know, I lived through it, uh, but I really did not understand or appreciate the ramifications it had for my favorite city. Now, I read the newspapers every day when growing up, but I was the type of kid that would go straight to the sports pages. <laughs> and I didn't actually read a lot about the merger mm-hmm. growing up. Really, the only, I, I didn't really understand or appreciate the ramifications that it had 
And the only thing I can recall during that time was that was the mayor at the time, Foster Pettit, was giving up the last two years of his mayoral term under the old city commission system because of his belief in the merger and how it would benefit the com community. Now, when I began to research this topic for the broadcast, I really began to understand the great significance of it. Now, for research, I used the usual old newspaper articles on microfilm that we have here in our great Kentucky room. If you ever need to look up anything of Lexington history, our microfilm uh, collection of newspapers is a great resource. It is a rich resource, yes. Yes, yes. People use it all the time. And we're not biased at all. No, no. no. Not, that <laughs> not that I will admit to. And, well, I used the newspaper articles, and I also used... Uh, Two books on the topic, The Politics of City-County Merger, The Lexington Fayette County Experience by William Lyons. Yeah, that's a, that's uh, a great we, resource. Yeah. Yes, we have a copy of that book, and it basically is an overview of the merger movement written by the chairman of the merger commission, William Lyons. And it's here in the Kentucky Room. It cannot be checked out because we have two copies. They're only Kentucky Room copies, yeah. but feel free to come in and take a look at it. Students over the years, I've had a couple students, I guess they were UK students, who were researching the merger and wasn't aware of this book. And I mentioned it, hey, there's this really good book about the merger. There are people out there who research these types of things. And, but anyway, that's a great book. There's a book entitled The Spider Election by uh, Mayor Foster Pettit, who was heavily involved in the merger movement and was actually mayor at the time. And now that book is also in the Kentucky Room and can be checked out. So that's a great resource uh, written by someone who was heavily involved in the merger movement. Both of these books I highly recommend to get a fuller picture of the merger movement. And also the Louis B. Nunn Oral History Project over at UK, there are numerous interviews with some of the main participants like Foster Pettit, and William Lyons in that collection over there about the merger. So that would be a good source. I haven't actually listened to any of those interviews about the merger, but I intend to because I'm sure it's quite fascinating. Yeah, generally that collection, the whole oral history collection, is pretty interesting, fascinating over there at UK. It's a, a massive project, and it's it's worthwhile to, to listen to from whether whatever you're you know researching and uh, to do with Kentucky. Yeah, it's a good yeah. resource. In this podcast, I'm going to give pretty much a simp simplified summary of the merger movement. But if you, for folks who want a more detailed account of it, these sources are great, great things to look at. Now, before the merger, over the years, as I mentioned, Lexington had many different forms of government to run the city and county governments. The city and county government was separate. Right before the merger, our political system consisted of a mayor and four city commissioners. They ran the city along with a city manager. And as far as the county, the judge executive, who at the time of merger was uh, Robert Stevens, who has the courthouse across the street named after him, and three county commissioners, they did the same for the county of Fayette. So you basically had two governments, two, two leaders. We also had separate departments for the city and county including police, fire, parks and recreation, health departments. And up until 1967, our schools. Yeah, were, that was one of the questions I was going to ask you is what, what happened with the school system? Yeah, I, th I think in 1967, they got a jump on merger and they, I guess they recognized how merging the city and the county school systems would benefit them. So the school systems merged, I believe, the 1967-1968 school year. I, th I think that's right. I know they merged before the government merger took place. And all, all of these departments, or some of them merged before the merger actually took place on January 1st, 1974, and it helped alleviate some of the problems that the merger proponents had to deal with putting together the, the merger. Like I said, the, the two forms of government, city and county, were separate with different financing and budgets and different departments that were duplicating services across the city and county line. It was not a very efficient 
way of governing for a growing city like Lexington. You know, as I mentioned in earlier podcasts, the the influx of industries such as IBM, Square D, et cetera, in the late 50s, early 60s was transforming Lexington from a small college town, horse farm area, into a booming metropolis. Okay, I exaggerate somewhat, (laughs) but you get the gist of it, that Lexington was growing. And as noted in something I read while researching this podcast, uh, the merger occurred at a critical junction in Fayette County history when rapid growth threatened to overpower a weak planning structure and jeopardize the resources that made Lexington unique. There was confusion where city limits ended and the county lines began. The boundaries, well, they were quite confusing. Zigzagging would be the best way to describe it. Uh, And it was a headache, especially for departments like the city and county police department and fire departments dealing with dangerous situations and trying to figure out their jurisdiction and handling these situations. One example of this is a story I ran across in my research where a future city police chief, then a police sergeant on the city police force, once arrived at a scene of a terrible car accident, only to find out it occurred across city lines and the city police department had no authority. The nearest county police were on the other side of town, and this police sergeant, city police sergeant, ignored orders to leave and rendered assistance. Those kinds of decisions is how you become a police chief, which this guy eventually did. Another example was when the county police department had a stakeout, a raid of a gambling establishment that was within city limits. They failed to notify the city police in fears that their stakeout and raid would leak out. And city police were not happy, and th- these types of situations created friction between the two departments. And yet another example of this jurisdiction problem would be fires in the county where sometimes the closest fire station would be the city fire department. They would actually be closer to respond to some fires that the county fire department had jurisdiction over. These were problems. Merger took care of that. And so a lot, a lot of things were double... Yes. Double duty, basically, and that doesn't <laughs> mesh quite well with when you have uh, critical situations like that, yeah. Oh, especially the critical oh, yes. situations where when I read that story about the police sergeant, I, I thought to myself, good for him. Yes. You know, some people would <laughs> yeah. say, oh, it's not my problem. Exactly. But anyway, merger not only would solve these constant ju- jurisdictional problems like fire and police and parks and recreation and so forth. But it also brought services like sewers, sidewalks, and streetlights, et cetera, out to the county residents. Merging the two governments would get rid of a lot of the conflicting planning goals of the separate governments, including duplication of services and an inequitable taxing system. Before merger, Lexington had been responding to its rapid growth by what was called annexation. And that meant that large portions of land outside the city limits would be annexed into the city and brought under the city umbrella, so to speak. Uh One of the problems with annexation was that, and if you read old newspaper articles from the 60s and 70s, which I have a hobby of doing, you would find articles quite frequently of areas being Annexed, Ask, quote unquote. Yeah, okay. asking to be annexed. and But the problem with annexation was that people living in the annexed area would have to start paying taxes on services that they were not receiving and may not receive in the near future. So they may be annexed and may start paying sewer fees and taxes for street lights, et cetera, but those services wouldn't be provided right away. So it it was unfair from a a taxing way. It just seemed to be a very inefficient and uneconomical way to do things. And that's just me reading through the research and and a lot of the experts, which I'm not one of, pretty much came to the same conclusion. And that's why merger was so attractive. Now, you have to keep in mind that this merger movement was not going to be easy, even though it made common sense to a lot of the folks who were proponents of it. It was not going to be easy to uh, get done. Many consolidation efforts in other cities before this time were not successful when they tried to merge their city and county governments. At the time that the merger was approved in 1972, only 20 such governments existed in the United States. 
And getting communities to agree to consolidate was not an easy thing. You know, politics were involved, personal agendas, et cetera. And it was not an easy thing to do. Yeah. So, we're, we're coming off a very volatile time in the national political scene. So, Yeah, this was right smack when the Vietnam War exactly. was coming to an end. And Now, actually, even in as late as 2014, only there was only 42 merged governments in the United States. So it's, it just was not an easy thing to get done. Now, you, you mentioned earlier about how it got started. The merger or consolidation of our governments can be said to have its beginnings in early 1970 when the General Assembly of Kentucky passed legislation allowing cities of a second-class status, which was Lexington status at the time, it allowed this legislation allowed allowed cities of the second class status to consolidate their city and county governments if they so desired. Like I said, in early 1970s, the two Lexington representatives who introduced this bill to the Kentucky General Assembly, uh, their names were Bart Peake and William McCann, both of them legislators. And actually, I think both of them, if I'm not mistaken, eventually served on Urban County Council down the road. Uh, so they did their part getting the merger started, and they did their part participating when the merger was complete. Well, anyway, they introduced a bill, and there was some tweaking that had to be done. The original bill, I think, allowed first-class cities to also merge, but I think the Louisville legislators were not in agreement with that. So they had to tweak the bill a little bit, and they finally got got it passed where it allowed second-class cities, which Lexington, like I said, was at the time, to consolidate their governments. And the bill passed, and the hard part was yet to come because there was much work to be done to see that such a merger came into being. Now, the 1970 census put the city of Lexington's population over 100,000. Thus, it made it eligible for first-class status. And if that would make it ineligible to merge. But some merger proponents here in Lexington, some very influential people, went to the General Assembly in 19, I think it was 1971 or 72, and using their influence got a delay with having Lexington classified as a first-class first city. So this allowed us to uh, go forward with the merger. Pass. And the next step was that the proponents of the merger here in Lexington had to lead a petition drive to form a merger commission to come up with a plan for consolidation. And this this was shortly after the bill was passed in early 1970. And once enough signatures were gathered in this petition, they were filed with the county clerk, and that was on November 10, 1970. So the merger commission was formed, and that led to the next step. 1971 and 1972, uh, the Charter Commission was formed and met, and it consisted of 15 members from the county, which was a county physical court, and 15 members from the city. They were appointed to this commission, headed by William Lyons, who was a political science professor at UK, and who I mentioned earlier about writing a book about merger, and more about him later. First meeting of the merger commission was in March 1971. They studied the merger movement, and the goal was to put together a merger charter, basically outlining how the consolidated government would function. Some of the issues they undertook were employee pensions, how that would work, how the taxes would work, how the services for both city and county would work, redistricting, which was a big portion of the merger movement, and also how strong they wanted to make the mayor uh, council form of government. If merger passed, you were going to have a mayor and 15 council members. A mayor and 15 council members, yeah, that's right. 12 council district members and three at-large members, which is in effect even today. Now, at this point, the 1971 uh, mayoral and city commissioner race, the city commissioners were basically what the council people are now and but we only had four in the city and three in the county. 1971, uh, there was a mayor's race and the city commissioner race, and it took place and it had a defining impact on the merger. Foster Pettit and his slate of four commissioners were definitely pro-merger, while the current city commissioner Tom Underwood and some of the other commissioners seemed to be putting up 
obstacles, including lack of financial support that was needed for the commission to succeed. Now, they didn't come right out and say they were against merger because it it was an election year, and there had been surveys taken that showed Lexington voters favored merger. So if you were against merger, you may lose your election. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to come out and go against the topic that people were for. Now, back in those days, you also have to remember the position of mayor was not quite as powerful politically. That's one of the things the merger did was it made the mayor's office more powerful. You know, make no mistake about it, uh, in a lot of ways, in the late 60s and early 1970s, Underwood, as a city commissioner at the time, ran the show. If you got backing from your fellow commissioners, you could do some things. And he, he was basically the guy that ran the show back then. But like I said, once once the surveys came out saying Lexington residents favored merger, the resistance that had been put up by the city appointees on this merger charter commission seemed to dwindle somewhat, uh, but not completely. The reason the 1971 mayor's election was so important, Foster Pettit defeated Underwood in the primaries and defeated Harry Sykes in the general election. So uh, as noted in, in Lyon's book, the, the 1971 election marked a major turning point in the history of the merger movement. Professor Lyons thought it was doubtful if the Underwood regime had been reelected, and that's how they referred to it, the regime, <laughs> uh, if it had been reelected, that the merger movement may not have been successful. When Pettit took office in, uh, I guess, early January of 72, he replaced 10 of the city members that had already been appointed on the commission, on the charter commission, who had already resigned or because of lackluster attendance, they just showed no interest in it. They, they were replaced. And one of the new appointees that Foster Pettit put on the commission was a UK political science professor, Malcolm Jewell, who was a nationally known scholar and expert on legislative bodies and legislative reapportionment. Years later, while I was a student at UK, I took two or three of Professor Jewell's political science classes, not knowing of his reputation as a national expert on these things. I rarely paid attention to who the teacher was when I signed up for <laughs> classes. You know, I just read the class description. I'm shocked, Wayne. Yeah. Just shocked. <laughs> I just read the class description in my uh, book and if it sounded interesting, I was pretty much sign me up. Jewel was an excellent teacher, and he had a way of making, I guess that's why I kept signing up for his classes after I took the first one. He was just a, a great teacher. He had a way of making reapportionment of districts, with the, which doesn't <laughs> sound like a very exciting topic, uh, but he made it out. He made it into a very interesting topic. Anyway, Jewel was instrumental in the drawing up of the 12 council districts. He he was an expert on it, and he he actually you know drew up the districts. Yeah. Now over the years, the districts have changed according to demographics and so forth. But the original council districts that were drawn up, Malcolm Jewell was the person who headed the committee to do it. Some other members of the Pettit appointees were John Butler, an IBM employee, was appointed. Uh, William McCann, the person who actually introduced the legislation, was appointed to the uh, Charter Commission. Marion Jordan, Marion with an N, <laughs> who was an active member of the League of Women Voters, was put on the commission. Farrah Van Meter, a, a city commissioner at the time and part of the Pettit slate of commissioners, was put on there. And then, uh, interesting, Mayor Pettit's secretary was put on the commission. I, well, I guess they tried to make an effort to have some women on the commission. When I'm wondering if there's any minorities in that commission. or John Butler was African-American, and I believe a future council member, Edgar Wallace, was on the commission. I, I saw his name mentioned quite a bit in Lyon's book about putting some ideas out there to the commission. So I think he served on it, too. So it, it wasn't just men. But you have to remember, this is early, early 1970. <laughs> Th things were different yeah. back then than, than they are today. You wouldn't be able to put a commission together without having a cross range of people. With the pro-merger Pettit administration in place, things ran a lot more sm smoothly for the merger commission. The financial support started coming from the city and and they met on a monthly basis, and, and meetings were open to the public. That's one thing that uh, I failed to mention. 
was that, you know, if you weren't on the commission, you still were able to watch able to come to the, or... yeah. But there wasn't a lot of, according to, to, to Professor Lyons, there wasn't a lot of involvement from the public in these meetings. And, you know, maybe they just didn't understand the importance. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, they're open to the public. And, you know, this merger was really going to shake things up in Lexington politics. And members even went on a weekend retreat of all places, the aptly named Shaker Town. Uh, that's my pun for the podcast, <laughs> by the way. Uh, but anyway, they spent a weekend retreat at uh, Shaker Town to help write up the merger charter. After all this work, the merger commission started in March of 1971 and on June 20th, 1972, the charter was complete. Now, the timeline here was important because if the charter was to be put to the to a referendum vote in the November 1972 election, it had to be completed 90 days before the election so the community would have time to study it. And I think there had to be a petition to actually place it on the ballot also. So timing was was everything. And by law, I think it would not be up for election if they didn't have it done in time for the 72 election. It would not be on the ballot again until November 1976. That was when the judge executive's office came up for re-election. And by law, I think it had to be put on there. So the, the next possible date would have been November 1976. And if you moved it to then, the Next possible date for the actual merger government to be enforced was January 1st, 1978. So you're talking, you know, four years. It's a long time. Yeah. And by then, the merger movement may have lost their momentum. Fizzled. <laughs> and, and, and let's not forget the first class city status would have probably taken place and we wouldn't have been even eligible. So anyway, we get the, the merger done and the merger proponents next step was They had to reach out to the community that was going to vote on this uh, referendum in November 1972. Uh, There was a petition that put it on the ballot for November 7th, 1972, and advertising campaign was put in place, and it was headed by Penrose Acton, community member who, by the way, is Acton Park over there off of uh, Turkey Foot Road off Tate's Creek is named. He died shortly after the merger movement. And so anyway, he headed this advertising campaign to, to the community about the benefits of the merger. And Acton, Pettit, Foster Pettit, and Robert Stevens, who was, like I mentioned, a county judge, they went to various groups and clubs edu- educating people about the benefits of the merger and advocating for the merger. The goal of the merger was to eliminate duplication of services and basically to take the zig and the zag out of the city limits boundaries. Of course, district representation, better services, equitable taxes, and a strong mayor-council form of government was also part of the merger program. Basically came down to the voters, you know, do you want to merge or do you want to just be annexed? And the proponents said you can't bet on the status quo being of benefit to you. When they would go out to these various clubs and groups, they would actually show a map of the boundaries of the city and county, the zigzagging of the boundaries and so forth. And Professor Lyons referred to this as the Rorschach test. (laughs) If you did nothing but look look at the boundary lines, you could see the inefficiency of how things are being done. Coffees were held in individual precincts. People go out and have these coffees and They bought time on TV and radio during the last week to hammer away the benefits of the merger. And actually, a bumper sticker was made. I don't know how popular it was. I don't recall seeing it on cars, but I didn't pay a lot of attention to things back then. (laughs) Uh, But anyway, a bumper sticker was made to put on cars that said, we've got the urge to merge. (laughs) uh, Anyway, with this great advertising push, the merger referendum on November 7th, 1972, passed by almost a two to one margin. And that that was really as, astonishing. Even to the even to the people who were on the merger commission and favored merger, they thought there would be some kind there would be more of a resistance put up. It was surprising there there really wasn't. But that this is what the people of Lexington decided they wanted. And I think they saw the, the benefits of the merger. Okay, so the the referendum was passed. 
And at this point, there was still work to be done. Just because it passed did not mean it would stick. There were legal obstacles to overcome, and opponents who were opposed to merger tried to get some petitions going, do away with merger, I think, after it was it was enacted. But you have to remember that this 1972 was also a presidential election, and there was that did not stick down the road either, right? Yeah. If, if we know our history. <laughs> okay. For, for you young folks, you can, you can look that up. Now, the referendum was passed, and so that meant the next year would be the election of the newly formed government with the mayoral election, the 12 council district races, and the three at-large council seats. But there still was the legal obstacles that had to be hurdled. On September 7th, 1973, the charter was ruled constitutional by Circuit uh, Judge James Park here in Lexington. And then uh, on December 28th, 1973, the Court of Appeals upheld the merger. So we were good to go. Merger officially began on January 1st, 1974, thanks to the Merger Commission and its leader, William Lyons. Now, Lyons, was a chair, as I mentioned, was the chairman of the commission, and he was basically the main architect of the charter, the LFUCG charter and merger. You know, when they, they talk about Lexington's most influential people in our history, uh, one should not underestimate the impact William Lyons had for our city with this merger work. You know, at the time of his death in 1994, Mayor Pettit, former Mayor Pettit, had called him the most important person in Lexington to cause the merger of the city and county governments. He noted about Lyons with the following. He wrote the charter. He was a leader. Mr. Lyons was to Lexington what Thomas Jefferson was to the country. He was not only instrumental in working out the mechanics of the merged government, he led the drive to get petitions signed that were needed. After the merger, officials from other cities who wished to try the same thing in their cities would actually come to Lexington to see William Lyons because he, he was, quote, the Bible on that issue. Yeah, especially since so few cities were able to do it successfully. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, and he covers all that in his book. If you really want a detailed analysis of the merger movement, not only here in Lexington, but in its failures in other cities and its, its pass, passings in other cities, Jacksonville, I think, passed theirs in 1967, and actually election officials went down to Jacksonville to study how they did it during during the merger commission meetings. So, But it wasn't a, a very successful thing to do in our country. Uh, and Lexington was unique, for whatever reason, when a merger vote yeah. <laughs> by that amount. Okay, on January 1st, 1974, the new government system began as the Lexington Fayette Urban County government. The 15 council members, 12 district and three at large, were sworn in. And as part of the oath, they had to swear that they had never participated in a duel. You know, that's the Kentucky Constitution the oath is you yeah. never participate in <laughs> no a duels. duel. Yeah. If he had still been alive, this would have left out our favorite podcast subject, Cassius Clay, from <laughs> yeah. serving on the council. You, you know, over the years, I've always watched the council meetings on government TV as a way to stay informed and to be quite honest, to be entertained. There's some <laughs> there's some very good meetings and entertaining <laughs> moments and entertaining debates and arguments, etc. Can you imagine Cassius Clay in oh, these me meetings? Wow. <laughs> yes. Now, it was time to implement the merger charter, but something is missing here on Inauguration Day. I mentioned the 15 council, new council members being inaugurated, but we have no mayor. Yeah. And, and why is that so? Well, that brings us to the 1973 mayoral election, which was held a couple months before, between Foster Pettit and James Amato, and it was known as the Spider Election. I mentioned Mayor Pettit's book uh, earlier, but the Bush-Gore 2000 election with their hanging chads uh, <laughs> had nothing on our 1973 mayoral election, which had hanging spider webs on a voting machine. It was a very close race with uh, James Amato, who years later became mayor and enacted or introduced our reversible lane systems on Nich Nicholsville Road, which I am happy with every time I drive into work. But anyway, it was a very close race, and Amato was certified the winner 
by the local election commission a couple days after the election by 112 votes. Wow, but that close. Yes, very close. Out of, I think, 40,000 votes, a little more than 40,000 votes, if I got my numbers correct. But anyway, there was a problem notice with the Ellsford precinct results, and it turned out that the ballot strips had been reversed on the voting machines. And what this meant was votes that were meant for Pettit went to Amato and vice versa. And one of the first people to notice this was, I think, Pam Miller, and that was future mayor Pam Miller. That was, I think, her first run for a council race. And her campaign manager or somebody in her campaign noticed that the votes that she got in the Ellsford district during a primary was two to one for, for her, but in the general election, it was two to one for her opponent or something. So her campaign manager noticed it and it didn't make a, it didn't have any impact, impact on her race because she won her race by so much. But he mentioned that this to one of Mayor Pettit's campaign people and, and they looked at the results from the primary and apparently Pettit did quite well in the primary, but in the general election, he did the complete opposite. So they started looking into it and, Sure enough, they found a problem with the ballot strips being reversed in in the machine. And like I said, votes meant for Pettit went to model and vice versa. Well, the the election was challenged and went through the court system. And one of the things that the uh, Pettit challenge had to prove was that the election ballot machine had not been tampered with by its back being opened up. And there was all kinds of security measures taken where that couldn't happen. But they were able to prove by various ways that the machine hadn't been tampered with, but that also inc- it also included the fact that there was a spider web that had been undisturbed on the back of the machine that if it had been tampered with would have not been there. So anyway, this proved the machine had not been open and, the, and the, uh, it was ruled an honest mistake. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll buy that. <laughs> okay. But anyway, on January 15th, 1974, the, Kentucky Court of Appeals favored, ruled in favor of Pettit, and he was ruled the winner by 54 votes. 54. And he was inaugurated as the new mayor of the council on January 17th. But anyway, the merger movement was a major event in Lexington's history. It took a few years to work out the kinks, but here it is, what, 50 years later? It seems to be working just fine, all things considered. All there's no <laughs> there's no such thing as a perfect government machine, but I think merger was of great benefit to this community over the years. Yeah, and, and it came at exactly the right time. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been able to if we were deemed a first class city. So yes. it was like by the skin of our teeth, we got. <laughs> and the community benefited too, you know, including the the county folks, because, like I said, if you if you've been annexed by the city government, either voluntarily or maybe not voluntarily that you're going to get taxed, you know, city taxes for for services you may not receive for a long time. So it was not equitable in terms of uh, services and taxes and so forth. But So like sewer, things like that? Se- sewer, uh, sewers and street lights seem to be the two big things that they were talking about. Apparently back then the county, res- the city, of course, had their own sewer system. And the county, I think, had private septic tanks. Mm-hmm. And same thing with trash pickup. In the county, it was uh, private collectors that would go out and collect their trash. But with a merged government, all these services would be the same for city and county. It, it was a it was a good thing for the community. So it was a positive generally for different agencies in the local government, like parks and recreation and police. Yeah, I failed to mention. Yeah, I mm-hmm. failed to mention that you know not only did the schools merge before the actual official merger, but the police and the fire department and Parks and Recreation, and I believe the Health Department all merged their departments, I think, in 72, 73. So before it officially came into Yes. And that, like I mentioned, really benefit the people who had to enforce the merger. Uh, One less thing to have to worry about. Yeah, they they merged before the official merger began on January 1st, 1974. That probably made it a little more seamless. Yeah. And, And there were some people... Even after the merger started, that of course, with anything, people are going to complain, and they didn't like something about the sewers, taxes, or whatever. And they, they were, they, they actually somebody started a campaign, purge the merge. <laughs> uh, but they, it never. They actually got a petition going, and 
And I think, according to Lions Books, they had enough signatures to, uh, you know, put it up for a vote or to put up for a vote or whatever. But it turned out that they studied the signatures and there's a lot of false signatures or <laughs> duplication of, yeah. of people. So they didn't have enough votes to do anything. And thankfully, I, I'd hate to think what would have happened if they... Because, like I mentioned earlier, the annexation was the other option. Yeah. You're, you're going to get eaten up by the city one way or the other. And the merger, I think, was a more fair and equitable way to do it, yeah. in my humble opinion. I'm not an expert. Anybody that listens to this. Well, that, I would imagine it would have affected the housing situation and you know people's choices where to live. And yeah. it would have affected a lot of things. Yeah, and you can look at the council representation now as opposed to... 50 years ago when the merger first happened, council, I think council district number one and council district number two were uh, represented by minorities mm-hmm. because uh, a huge population in those districts. Yeah. And that, that's the way Malcolm Jewell drew up district boundaries is they wanted to have representation from from minority yes. communities. And, yes. Yeah, that was actually one of my questions is how did it affect the predominantly African-American black communities um, in Lexington, this merger? Yeah, there there was uh, two council districts, I believe is District 1 and District 2, that had heavy minority votes. Now, it is interesting. I mentioned Harry Sykes, who lost the 1971 mayor election to uh, Mayor Pettit. He was actually the first African-American city commissioner voted in in 1963 and this was at large voting so it, and i'm sure there's folks out here there who probably were involved in this merger that know a lot more about it than i do and i just tried to provide a simplified summary of what happened feel free to email us your comments it is a fascinating subject and like wayne said you can always email us with with questions we'll try to answer them as best we can but it is a fascinating subject, and especially since we're coming on a, a big anniversary for, for, the, for the merger. Thank you, Wayne, for your research, and thank you for sharing everything that you found okay. with us and Thanks. with our listeners. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Tales from the Kentucky Room, a podcast brought to you by the Central Library's Kentucky Room staff at the Lexington Public Library. If you enjoyed listening, please take a minute to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher. If you have any questions about local history or genealogy research, you can visit us in the Kentucky Room to use our collection and newspaper microfilm, or you can email us at elibrarian at lexpublib.org. That's elibrarian at L-E-X-P-U-B-L-I-B dot org. I'm Miriam, and we'll be back with another trip down Lexington's memory lane.